Hello everyone, welcome to Active Directory Solution Center. My name is Sai. I'm a Directory Services MVP. Um, my day job includes, I work as a Senior Infrastructure Consultant in uh, Avanade, Australia. In today's session, we're going to look at the initiatives in an identity and access management strategy. Um, in my previous podcasts, we have say we have heard like we have looked through different identity ma and access management uh, processes involved, and today we're going to extend um, understanding the initiatives uh, <coughs> in an identity and access management uh, frameworks. So every organization will have different business drivers for determining and implementing an identity and access management strategy. So to ensure the greatest possible chances of success, strategy must align with business goals. Um, this actually drives business results and, and the priorities uh, should concern or should con the following priorities should be considered for, for the successful IAM projects like the, 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 main, the first one would be fast results, improve executive sponsorship. Um, address high risk areas early, um, like address the security issues, uh, which are the which are often the primary business concerns, which should be addressed as quickly as possible. Um, the the next one would be more on the standards and the infrastructure um, that's uh, on which the IAM solution is being developed. So we might have uh, different policies coming into picture. We have like a past investments being made on the infrastructure, which need to support them for the IAM uh, going further. So these are the major ones. I mean, these are the key aspects, but each organization that contemplates an identity and access management strategy will have a unique combination of goals and priorities to consider. Right, so the the following discussions or the second or the discussions which which I'm going to make in going further will be a will be more on the common initiatives that that spread across and that should be followed across any of the identity and access management project. So those includes uh, like establishing security and access policies, uh, establishing directory services and security standards. Uh, we're going to talk about implementing identity aggregation and synchronization. Uh, we're going to talk about like automating provisioning and deprovisioning. Uh, what are the effect, What are the uh, what are the issues? What are the challenges on these? Uh, we're going to talk about the <coughs> providing effective group ma management, uh, consolidating identity stores, which is really a key one. Uh, we're going to look at the, like uh, providing password management and synchronization. Uh, enabling interoperability and single sign-on, uh, strengthening authentication mechanisms, improving access for employees, customers, and partners, uh, establishing security auditing policy. Uh, we're going to talk about updating software procurement standards. Um, we're going to talk about establishing software development standards for identity use and finally we're going to talk about developing and migrating identity over applications uh, each of these topic what i do is like i'm going to discuss about the benefits and the challenges involved in each of these pillars the ones which i've described earlier so the first one which we talk about is establishing security and access policies many organizational security policies that involve people, processes, and technology elements can be directly implemented in directory services. But others will be controlled by processes and specific systems that have the capabilities to enforce security policy. Organizational access policies could specify at a global level uh, where the business rules regarding access or specific uh, function uh, our group of applications um, are defined. So such access policies are usually defined in terms of role, either in terms of resource or in terms of operation or uh, and the restrictions and stuff. So a few of the examples of security and access policies and the rules within them include 
um, I would say access management policies, uh, which may be dictated that stale accounts should be regularly pruned from identity stores. Uh, the next one would be password policies, uh, which may state that account, account pa passwords must be changed on a regular basis. Uh, the next one would be security audit policies, uh, which may define which action must be reported on. Uh, we're going to talk about the private policies, which may define the right to be left alone um, and the information privacy rules. Um, so these are the these are the examples of security and access policies. And we have some more for access management policies as well. Like we're going to say VPN access requires a smart card or other multi multi-factor authentication. So this is one of the rules. Specific applications require biometric authentication. And when users are accessing extranet uh, applications uh, to a certain systems, there should be a, a policy defining who are the authentication authenticated users that's that going to grant access on these external systems or the internal systems from an external access has been made. Um, we need to have a access management policy defined for domain administrator logon. Um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna most organizations uh, I haven't seen where they say domain admin access requires a smart card authentication. That would be a, a good investment, and that would be a recommended investment as well. Um, I would say the access management policy should be defined for computer connections uh, to a high value systems require IPsec encryption. So you have, say for example, we have a finance uh, sector, financial sector where the numbers flows in and the applications pick up those numbers and displays on the graphs. How secure is this whole communication all about? So how, how secure is storing of these information into the SQL or maybe Oracle data store? Do we have a sort of encryption defined uh, for to manage these or not? So if there isn't any, then it is highly advisable to set up an IPsec encryption, and that's that's going to be a win-win uh, um, sort of a data handling mechanism. And the last one for the access management policy would be like withdrawals from the computer accounts by tellers only between hours, like. We're going to say these contractors will only work from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. and after 5 p.m. We're going to we're going to revoke their access. So that's that's one of the access management policy. So with these, we have uh, we have potential benefits of establishing security and access policies. So what are the benefits? We're going to look at the benefits of this. The benefits include includes like increased security across organization. Uh, the other benefits would be increased security to specific high-value um, systems or high-value servers or high-value applications. Um, the other benefit would be increased uh, security audits, so, so that nothing goes uh, really smooth, not, nothing slips around. So everything will be documented, everything will be audited, and will have uh, precise control on what's, what's happening in your organization. Um, the other benefit they would be the regulate, regulatory compliance. The, everything is, is compliance and, and everyone adheres to the policies set by the organization, by the IAM rules. Well, these are the benefits and uh, these are the, for every benefit I would say there is a challenge associated. I mean, what are the challenges for establishing the security and access policies? Uh, the f the primary challenge would be like establishing appropriate security requirements for each access scenario. That that's the critical one. So, and the next one would be implementing policies within chosen technologies while acknowledging any constraints and limitations. <coughs> We're going to see uh, the other challenges will come in uh, uh, while establishing security and access policies include a management overhead and reduced efficiency that increased security without automation may, may bring. So there's nothing, it's like everything is manual, manually man managed and there is a certain amount of management overhead which, which involves managing this process in a short line. 
and I would say the next challenge it would be more complex security mechanisms should be in place and we need to have the people who is going to manage these security mechanisms should be aware of what they're doing and 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 finding the right match on the in the in the in the market is is one of the challenge and and also the trainings being provided and 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 how fast the uh, the the guys who is who's going to use these IAM uh, policies should should have that knowledge and the other one would be like managing conflicting security requirements so certain systems say I'm going to follow uh, certain security requirements and which may conflict with the uh, second IAM strategy or IAM access policy which which doesn't uh, comply with so you need to carefully design the access policies and uh, and, and and the and these are the challenges and these are the benefits associated with the uh, security and access policies. Uh, we're going to next move on to the second topic, uh, the second topic discuss about establishing directory service and security standards. So in this scenario, we're going to see like uh, whether uh, irrespective of what sort of a directory uh, network directory is in place in the organization we always need to have a standard directory service as a primary enable of identity and access management. Uh, there is no hard fast rule that we need to go with the Microsoft Active Directory or we need to go with IBM or we need to go with uh, Novell. But to achieve an IAM uh, design, we need to have a certain directory in place. So, however, our organizations often find that more than one directory services uh, is needed, um, such as like uh, like over overnight we're going to have like a mergers, and overnight we're going to have like acquisitions happening, and say um, certain directory accounts being managed in company A will be moved on to the company B, the, which is got which got acquired, right? So we're going to have like Active Directory in one place. We might have an IBM coming in in the other place, and 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 the and the and there are some other different scenarios where there is no mergers or acquisitions, but a vendor has developed his application uh, which performs certain functionality to the organization, but that doesn't support Active Directory as a primary data source. It, it, it actually uses maybe SQL or maybe uh, maybe a strong IBM uh, shop where, where, where they involve the IBM uh, identity store to be a, a primary identity store. So these these are the challenges. So, and the organization which is using, they, they don't have the expertise in how to manage the IBM, so they switched on to uh, free Microsoft enterprise level identity store which is Active Directory. So you may have uh, multiple uh, directory uh, applications coming into play. So in order to manage all these things we need to have an effective identity and access management strategy which consolidates these into minimum number of identity stores. A, f a first plan as a identity management architect is to minimize the number of stores in your organization. If you see there are four stores in place, uh, your first role should be, or first goal should be like, go ahead and minimize them, go ahead and remove as many number of possible. If there are no any overheads involved, if there is no application overhead, just go ahead and uh, consolidate into one, right? So the directory services can enforce the security policy standards but organization may find considerable difference in their internal operations so as i said like for example a department or finance department may have come into existence because of an acquisition that involves a separate directory service and security policies uh, as i reiterated earlier so because these standards related to identity are often tightly integrated uh, with uh, with the network directory service, they should always be discussed together. You, you should not have a team discussing about the directory services, uh, which is totally different than the other teams, uh, which is ta talking about the directory or identity management solution under the same roof. So that doesn't that doesn't sounds really good. Um, well, we're going to talk about the benefits of uh, benefits of having the uh, directory services and the security standards. So 
the primary benefit or one of the benefit is like you're going to reduce administrative overhead to manage these things and you're going to have like a simplified provisioning system where you're going to say well the system does abc it's going to do auditing it, it's, it's going to lock my system down it's going to provide only the required access to the administrators so by following these it's going to increase the security i mean end of the day you have your data staying in your network and you don't really uh, need to worry about like who's accessing and what sort of a employee is entering into the organization because an IAM strategy is not meant to be just just for an in small size mid company where you have like a uh, you trust the people it is for it is also for the enterprise organization where we have like 50,000 users spread across the entire globe where we where the where the IAM architects located in one central location does not even understand or doesn't even need to know who are the guys present in the remote location so there is no people trust involved in IAM it's all about the systems and how the security is managed with all the benefits uh, there are challenges includes um, the some of the challenges includes uh, are the line of business application and platforms with specific directory needs that need to be considered as a priority um, and one of this challenge, one of the stuff which I've seen is like incompatible security policies that never going to get aligned. So, yeah, we have hours together discussions on whether the certain policy should be in place or certain policy should be removed. But there is no consistent uh, answer for this. So some some departments require this and some other needs that we need to understand what is the common factor between both and come into one uh, simple agreement like re reduce these policies and make it as universal policy and you're going to have like a, a regulatory requirements for information and management boundaries within organization um, such as keeping the personal banking business separated from the insurance banking if i if i'm looking from a banking perspective uh, the ib and pb are the two major <coughs> two common Jargon's been used, and we're gonna we're gonna say like mm, we're gonna follow a different parts of process for all, both of them. Uh, that's that's the real challenge. And um, the other one would be like finding a common authentication protocol that existing applications and identity stores across the organization can use. Um, and presenting entitlements in a common format that different application and system across the organization consume that's that's going to be more more tricky so these are the challenges and the benefits uh, for the for establishing directory services and security standards um, now we're going to move on to the move on to our third topic which is uh, implementing identity aggregation and synchronization right so in many cases it is not practical to migrate identity stores and applications to standard directory services however uh, it is often possible to reduce management cost and minimize low productivity by integrating such systems uh, to share the identity information and create and maintain the same entitlements through common policies so your identity aggregation comprises of uh, this linking of multiple digital identities from a number of identity stores right so with with integration aggregation there is no way to recognize a certain uh, employee name in the human resource system um, is the same as the email uh, name so uh, which means to say like if I say Lee George Z or Z in human resource system is the same person as George Lee in the internet or G dot Lee in the email directory so there is no the way to recognize that so identity aggregation and synchronization allows your organization to create and maintain a digital identity in its entirely uh, identity integration service like 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 a common common uh, integration service uh, which is provided by FEM or uh, yeah, provide by the FIM service. So, what are the benefits of these? Um, 
The benefits of identity aggregation and synchronization r includes uh, reduced administration overhead. It's going to increase your business information provided from a, un a unified view of all the digital identities in the organization. It's going to improve identity administration from a single identity stores. And there are the challenges. There are some challenges associated with aggregation. So they are not some. They are they are uh, they are quite a bit. Uh, the first one would be like discovering all the management identity stores in the organization. We're going to agree to the ident uh, ag aggregate identity stores. That's the uh, humongous job. Like nobody's going to agree agree on aggregating identity stores and synchronizing information. They have their own challenges. They they have their own views. So that's going to be challenging uh, stuff and. I'm going to say choosing the choosing which attributes are owned by which identity stores. So this is the role of an IAM architect who should say these are the list of attributes being used and this is the list of attributes being used in the different identity stores. So what are the common? How can we say uh, a, a in do we does the both has the common names? or as similar names at least so that we can we can safely start using them and we can say is like that's a challenge so the the other challenging aspects would be cross dependent department collaboration among human resources or maybe i'll say it departments legals and other participating business divisions so uh, that's other one and we're going to say determining the authoritative source of various attributes that's coming from digital identity uh, that's one of the key and critical uh, time-consuming activity of, of identifying where is the source. Once we do all this stuff, I mean, there's another few of the most uh, time-consuming tasks, which is like creating a global view of identity information. So that's, that's one of the things I mentioned earlier, like create a global view and, and perform auditing changes. So you audit information. So once you have the global view, audit the information and and try to understand where are these, how does these map? And finally, once you get the info, you synchronize the identity information. So it sounds really easy, but these are the challenges. I mean, these are the real challenges. Uh, I would say pointing few is like creating a global view is a big challenge. Auditing them is going to be another uh, massive ones and synchronizing are the key ones from the ones which I listed before. So we're going to move on to the the uh, fourth uh, pillar, which is automating, provisioning, and deprovisioning. So organizations want new employee and contractors to be productive as soon as possible. So they cannot really afford to have staff sitting on the bench or sitting on waiting hours and days together to obtain an access to the applications or obtain an access to their systems. Like this is a typical uh, consulting example where you've been staffed onto the uh, project and you just keep waiting for your access because you don't have an access to either log on to your SharePoint, the company or the, the customer SharePoint, or you don't have an access to log on to email systems or uh, the desktop. So, the organizations wants to minimize these things uh, when the new employees or new new contractors join the organization. So, automated provisioning can take a new entry from one identity store and create a corresponding entries in each of the managed identity stores. That's the beauty of that, right? So, deprovisioning works in reverse. So. Uh, Deprovisioning is like noting a change in one store, such as disabling an account and then propagating that change to other identity stores. So, therefore, an alteration of a value in uh, in a single field uh, in one of the in any of the connected identity stores uh, can disable or delete series of digital identities across multiple stores in minutes. So, if if a if a IAM administrator say I'm going to change the employee status from current to former. It's going to replicate within seconds and he becomes a former and he loses the rights, privileges, everything. Uh, so you need to be, that's, that's the, uh, uh, 
that's something needs to be taken care of. I mean, you can't simply go ahead and make the changes uh, as an uh, as an uh, when there are there are some changes needs to be made. So you need to validate those requests and understand what is the future implications what is the current implications for that particular step needs to be taken care of so and with these ones we have like a benefits uh, advantages the advantages includes uh, the reduction cost through automatic creation and deletion of accounts in multiple identity stores we don't need a dedicated uh, employees to be sitting there just for disabling and enabling the uh, accounts uh, we're going to increase the productivity by reducing the time required to create accounts, um, passwords and access rights for new employees or contractors uh, or consultants. So in the other benefits uh, of automated provisioning would be automated generation of necessary attributes such as mailboxes and account names. Uh, we're going to see this sim simplifies and becomes more easy for group member management, um, membership management. Um, easier role management and increase security by ensuring uh, that employees who leave the organization have all their access rights withdrawn immediately. So these are the benefits. And what are the challenges? The challenges include uh, determining the business process that leads to provisioning. Is there any common business process that we need to follow? Uh, every business has their own uh, process. Every business have their own process based on the uh, info in the in uh, based on the infrastructure they use and the policies they have. So we need to align um, the automated provisioning to the business process. Um, we need to understand what departments and approvals are needed for provisioning new accounts. So that's one of the other challenge. Um, the the other one would be once we understand these, the other challenge would be. Uh, addressing business processes delays that affect uh, the timely provisioning and security provisioning uh, and once we get these things done we're going to see like uh, how efficient how easy how quick a manual task can be converted into the automated process so for this to be done a, the user who is managing needs to understand what is the current existing manual process and how easy and efficient he can migrate or he can convert using the, the IAM strategy uh, using the tool which, which supports automation, automatic provisioning and deprovisioning. So with these like um, uh, the, the other one would be like we have to collect the necessary information quickly to ensure the prompt provisioning is done in a right time. Right. The, so these are the these are the benefits and challenges. And uh, well, I mean, it's 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 going to be it's going to be a, a project life cycle defined each for each of the phase. And uh, the the IAM engineer should need to or IAM architect needs needs to be uh, well associated with the policy and the process in the organizations to understand the benefits and challenges of these uh, the IAM strategies. And we're going to move on to the next one. The fifth pillar is automating group membership, <coughs> or I would say automating group management. The group management uh, is a key role. Any organizations, we're going to have like a uh, bunch of users in a group. And it, as in the directory service, it's, it is pretty easy for, uh, for the groups to be managed uh, rather than the individual objects. So group management enables the automatic automated provisioning and deprovisioning uh, through the distributed groups or for the emails or security groups you're going to create so uh, these are common across either IBM uses in a different way Microsoft names it as a different way so but the but the context and the usage are are, are, are the common goal so which is like simplify simplification you have a group you need to associate a policy to the group and anyone in the group will have uh, the common rights. What are the benefits of them? Um, there are several benefits like uh, like you get an increased security resulting from greater control to the group memberships uh, as anyone, anyone with the minimum Active Directory administration 
uh, have a good good view of group memberships and the uh, and the uh, administration of them. We're going to do an assignment of employees to correct groups during provisioning, uh, and also that we can uh, adjust that with the automation stuff that they uh, they use. Uh, we're going to remove the accounts from the group when user leaves the organization. Uh, well, uh, in, a, in a practical world, I've seen this never happens. So when, I, when a user moves, off, uh, moves out of the organization or maybe from a department, his account still be in there. So, but the automation will actually take care of that, that piece and ensures that this guy, when he moves out of the uh, department or the organization his whole his rights are revoked so he's been moved out, out of the required groups and uh, the another another piece would be like a, another benefit would be creation of a query based groups uh, such as distribution lists or you're gonna you're gonna you know, you're gonna redirect or uh, a particular message to uh, to a particular department so the distribution list is is one of the classic uh, win for any group mem group management uh, activities they have the challenges every, every every other pillar has a challenges so the challenges of automated group membership or group management includes you going to identify the appropriate security and distribution groups and place those members into those groups that's the challenge and you have to standardize on attribute values to avoid unnecessary creation of query based groups. Um, we're going to implement a suitable audit process to keep track of group creation and membership. And, and this, these, these things are challenging and the last one is more, much more challenging which is like complying with regulatory requirements. So you can't simply go ahead and keep creating your groups uh, with your own names and and under the different OUs, we, if I'm talking from a Microsoft-based perspective, we need to have a certain uh, process in order to create a right group and associate that with the with the group uh, with the members. But this, um, <coughs> so these are the uh, these are the some of uh, the automation, uh, the challenges and benefits uh, of the the group management and what we have seen so far is like how we can secure uh, provide security and access policies what are the directory service and security standards uh, we have seen the benefits and the challenges associated associated with it uh, we have seen the how we're going to implement identity aggregation and synchronization uh, we have seen uh, uh, we have seen the automation provisioning and deprovisioning, um, and we have seen the uh, effective uh, group man uh, group management. So, the next topic, the the sixth pillar is like uh, consolidating identity stores. So, as I said, like any organization when they do acquisitions and mergers or we're gonna we're gonna have like a different application supporting uh, a unique uh, identity store we always have to have a different people managing it and and the task of an IAM architect would become more more tough and more trivial to to centralize the process so which like beyond the aggregation and synchronization of identity data is like reducing the number of identity stores so that should be his primary task right so identity data may be synchronized and managed between identity stores through largely automated mechanisms however like these mechanisms and the exceptions defined that will be uh, almost certainly occur generate based on the uh, i mean what I meant to say is like this pro process will actually increase the management overhead and also will increase security uh, attack surface. So just for example, I mean, if an organization has two applications that use LDAP for authentication and authorization, then it might be possible to combine separate LDAP identity stores into one single store. Uh, so these are the this is one of the classic example of the IAM uh, administrator or architect role to understand 
what are the applications that needs to be combined well how well how easy that i can minimize the identity stores and what are the benefits involved with this uh, there are several benefits i mean i would say the main benefit is the management overhead you don't have or you don't need a separate uh, dedicated staff in order to look take care of these policies and keep managing them you're going to reduce them and uh, you're going to say we're going to reduce the tco by eliminating servers and licenses how awesome is that even if it's a virtual license i mean even if it's a virtual machine the licensing cost is the killer even if you don't have a physical infrastructure to manage you still need to pay the license and the managed operations you're going to you're going to remove those costs you're going to say like you're going to reduce server maintenance requirements that's that's the another benefit you're going to say less cost hardware and software upgrades so even in the virtualized world we would say um, there is n there is only f like like a nullified hardware uh, cost involved but the software upgrades are precious and and the guys who are managing these systems are also needs to be taken care of so with these things the other benefit of reducing the identity store would be easier application deployment right so these are the ones and and the challenges the key key guys so the key ones the key challenges are creating an aggregate schema in a single identity store so that's critical. Uh, differences between LDAP and other protocol implementation on different identity stores are always different. This is the key key point that I want to raise. Like when when consolidating, I always always have these experience. Like uh, uh, you have like different applications supporting uh, different protocol, different identity stores, and none of them comply to LDAP. They use an independent protocol to support these. Um, and how do you do it? Well, the answer is no. I mean, you can't really uh, say, I have the budget and I'll go ahead and record my whole uh, application, which is which is highly unlikely to be the to be the case. So, uh, so that's one of the challenge which needs to be taken care of. And the application migrations, when you do this, when, when if an organization say, well, we're gonna we're gonna remove the old protocol and we have to go with the LDAP protocol now. So the the basic or major challenge would be, what's the effort required uh, to uh, to manage this whole code migration process? And in the event of the code migration, you may also see that few of the functionalities provided by the earlier uh, application protocol may not be. Uh, might not be fixed or may not be suitable for LDAP or any other migrate migration migrating protocol. So those are the challenges needs to be in place. So the next one, the next pillar is uh, the seventh pillar is providing password management and synchronization. Right. Password management and synchronization uh, takes the identity aggregation process a step further. So if you look at the close, like password management involves a number of areas such as you're going to establish and enforce password policies, change or resetting the passwords, example, etc. So this, the password sync uh, then propagates these changes to all the connected identity stores. Right. Say, for example, like we have uh, a password management and synchronization tool that can enable users to change their network logon passwords, uh, or SAP account credentials, or email account credential, and extra, extra net collaboration passwords in one operation. So, password sync enables grouping uh, with strong password policies on critical systems and weaker policies on others. So that cannot handle uh, the mod modern password strength uh, stuff. So you have like a central uh, central uh, portal or central policy in place which can do this job for you to manage one single password for all the different applications. So the, the benefits of uh, password management and synchronization includes like you're going to reduce the administrative and the support cost uh, because help desk staff do not have to reset user password for multiple identity stores 
You're going to increase security by limiting the number of passwords user must remember and reducing the likelihood that users will write passwords down. Um, so that's another benefit. The, the third one would be uh, you're going to increase the security resulting from consistent password policy uh, application with uh, regard to policy elements such as password length, complexity requirements, and etc. So the, the, the other benefit would be reduce idle time while users wait for support from the help desk to reset their passwords. They no longer need to be waiting on the call just for the password reset and, and that increases your productivity as well. So what are the challenges involved? Um, challenges involved as um, password management and synchronization uh, have to be managed with the multiple password policies uh, that have different criteria for length and complexities. So the, the, uh, they have to deal with password expiry and history intervals across multiple platforms. Uh, have to capture password changes from multiple platforms if required. We don't know. So that's one of the uh, requirements. One of the challenge so we need to also need look in the uh, ensure that users who are who they say they are when requesting a password reset i may simply sneak in your system and say hey just reset here is there a is there a security question that you need to put in place even before a password reset occurs yes pretty much ensure that newly reset passwords are sent in a secure fashion to the end user uh, you just don't display the password on the uh, on the uh, on the screen, just send it through an email uh, or send an SMS to your mobile. So you have different methodologies in order to send these passwords. So all protected the protect password stuff. So dealing with applications and services that have hard coded or locally configured passwords. So that's the key challenges in uh, providing the password management and synchronization uh, in an organization. So we'll move on to the next uh, next pillar, which is the eighth pillar is enabling interoperability and uh, single sign-on. Right, so cross-platform interoperability scenarios vary enormously from organization to organization. So each of them has unique combination of directory services, applications, identity stores, databases to integrate. So some of the methods include, so the inter, interop methods include uh, integrating with server operating system, uh, any version, any flavor, like I wouldn't speak about like a 2003, but I would say 2008 and above. Uh, they have to use a secure standard based authentication protocol such as Kerberos version five. Uh, they have to use the LDAP authentication and authorization for application or platform that do not support Kerberos version 5. And, and you're going to say like employee credential mapping and enterprise SSO uh, uh, for the products which do support like SharePoint, maybe BizTalk, maybe Office 365. And uh, you're going to synchronize usernames and passwords ac across multiple platforms and applications. So <clears throat> And, and, and the last one would be like implementing WebSSO for internet and intranet based uh, intranet based applications. So these are the interop uh, methods uh, for different different products that I've discussed. And they have a, they have a good amount of benefits. Uh, one is like a streamlining application deployment. Uh, you're going to achieve uh, you're going to achieve the higher standards for authentication and data security on network. You're gonna reduce time. Uh, you're gonna reduce time in user spending for authenticating to multiple identity stores. Right, so with these, we also have the good amount of challenges. Uh, the challenges of inter interop and single sign-on includes choosing the right mechanism for the platforms found in the organization. So they have to choose between web and network SSO mechanism where both options are available. Uh, they have to choose how and when to use LDAP directory services for auth and authorization and authentication. 
And the other challenges includes when to reconfigure applications and platforms for implementing password uh, propagation. So these are the these are a few of the challenges um, for interop and single sign on. So with these, I mean, we we we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna deal with the minor variation in implementations of uh, standard based authentication mechanisms. But these are the key for uh, key challenges involved. And we're gonna go with the next pillar. The next pillar talks about strengthening authentication mechanisms. How how awesome is this topic? So, and most of the organizations will keep looking at the what are the what are the mechanisms or how do I strengthen the authentication mechanisms? So there are many reasons for choosing to implement stronger authentication mechanisms. So they, the initiative could be part of general uh, plan to strengthen the security of organizations' computing resources. It could be a response to specific threat or it could be a response to a successful attack. So finally, it could be necessary to meet industry or regulation uh, standard in order to achieve non-reputation or similar ability. So, so these are the, the, the major, the majority of organizations, I mean, if you look at the organization implementations for authentication, they still use the combination of username and the password, right? They still use these for authenticating to the desktops, for applications, they use uh, for different resources or printer, scanner, etc. So you're going to have like a password based authentication mechanisms can range from very secure to very insecure depending upon implementation of applications, your protocol, identity store and length and complexity of the password. So let's talk about like a uh, like a secure, more secure non-password based mechanisms and technologies such as X5 X.509 digital certificates. Uh, time-based hardware um, tokens are also known as one-time OTP devices or secure secondary configure, confirmation using biometric authentication. These are like like a like a giant uh, multi-factor authentications. Like you want to provide the tremendous security, so you can combine these these things. So you, you can't you can't simply say, well, all the organizations should follow these. Well, I would say, why don't we have a hybrid scenario where you're going to use a combination of these for only those applications which are really critical, and for those uh, applications which are not, then just don't then uh, don't just involve these uh, critical uh, implementations. And the customers might co might come back and say, well, I mean, even for a single app, we're going to invest the amount. So. It's not about the cost; it's about more about the security that we're going to bring in into the plate, right? I mean, uh, so for example, we're going to bring like X509 digital certificate on a smart card uh, with a pin that unlocks the private key associated with the certificates and creates very strong credentials uh, for a for a finance application. So this is one of the use case scenario that I listed. So, what are the benefits? In benefits. It's it's obvious it's a increased security and we're going to align with the regulat regulatory compliance or requirements that require additional validation uh, for the for the critical systems. So the challenges uh, uh, challenges involved uh, involved are like uh, balancing the cost of additional infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier. So again, the need for improved security. Uh, integrating stronger credential mechanisms and authorization protocols, I would say authentication protocols, sorry, so across different platforms and applications. With this, you're going to avoid uh, increasing end user and management complexity. Uh, you're going to say multi-factor mechanisms offer often increase the number of things that can go wrong, right? I mean, y y the guys who are really managing the multi-factor mechanisms knew about this I mean this gonna go uh, put you in a wrong bad bad position in a wrong time and, and you keep troubleshooting this stuff so the other challenges would be minimizing the cost that's not going to happen with this uh, with this mechanism because you have to invest in order to get the optimal or the highest amount highest security authentication um, so 
we've discussed about like a like the challenges and the benefits involved in strengthening but i would say if your business is critical you need to have certain amount of security in place and uh, for moving further i mean i'm going to discuss about the other pillar uh, the other pillar talks about improving access for employees customers and partners right so many organizations we have seen like many organizations wants to optimize their information systems for competitive advantage by broadening access to to include more types of users apps and networks so this approach is often referred to as expanding perimeter of the network because firewalls around the organization network no longer provide a single uh, barrier to keep extranet users so for example like uh, if i say a customer access to information and applications enable new business opportunities so the business partners simplify supply chains by uh, integrating inventory shipping financial and uh, other development systems uh, for sharing the confidential pricing product and support information so with this like uh, employees have more opportunities for collaboration and communication uh, remotely as 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 they work closely with customers and partners so this is one of the use case uh for expanding the perimeter of the network and we're going to uh, we're going to say what are the benefits associated with this the benefit is like rapid application deployment uh development uh i would say faster i would say rapid application deployment and development and the deployment uh we're going to say increase control of access to resources um better end user experience you're going to get like uh, and finally the common word reduce administrative overhead so well i mean you you heard about the benefits and what are the challenges associated with this so you're going to integrate with the existing apps that's one of the challenges uh choosing appropriate identity stores so out of all the pillars this is this going to be a common uh point like choose identity store minimize identity stores and so we're going to say uh the other challenges in improving access for external users would be choosing an ap- appropriate authorization model and authentication mechanisms and we're going to say uh how do we grant users to appropriate resources and if the organization agrees like no we're going to go with the two um identity stores so now the challenges would be how do we manage these identity stores for partners or customers so those those are the few of the challenges uh with uh, but for improving uh, access to employees customers or consultants and partners and, and the other uh, other guys so we're going to move on to the next pillar we're going to talk about like establishing security audit policy uh interesting one a a typical organization has security policies that require auditing at both the platform or both the windows or any any platform or in the application level so one of the biggest benefits of implementing some of the identity and access management initiatives uh, uh is to consolidate identity stores consolidate the platforms authentication authorization mechanisms and and so on so this consolidation makes auditing easier and more reliable uh, because the number of places and the manner in which the security events are generally uh, generated is is reduced i mean you don't have have to worry about these events anymore it's like completely reduced right so what are the benefits they have their own benefits so you're going to reduce effects of undergoing an external security audit major one we're going to improve ability to execute forensic operations uh in the event of a security attack occurs uh pretty much so we're going to improve ability to detect attacks in real time thus altering administrators to initiate emergency procedures right and that helps like uh, and that has a, a, a another associated point like you're going to able uh, have the ability to retroactively enforce policies that are difficult to enforce at the time of occurrence so these are the uh, few of the good benefits around uh, the security audit policy 
So what are the challenges uh, of establishing a security audit policy? Um, well, by now you would have said different auditing mechanisms in platforms and applications. We have the, the major challenge would be auditing capabilities with different deg degrees of uh, specifications. That's, that's time consuming. And we're going to, we're going to have like challenges uh, for audit requirements for different business units and challenges associated with auditing the reports in a central location, right? So, and we, the other challenge would be filtering those volumes of information, like it'll be humongous amount of info and you have to filter them and generate the reports based out of, out of those uh, would be, would be a massive challenge. And and for the organizations which follow a enterprise level archiving solution, these things becomes more easy. But for the orgs which don't have an archiving policy in place, at least the ones which are supported, uh, the the challenge would be archiving large amount of auditing data. So, <coughs> sorry. So these are the challenges associated with uh, with the with the establishing security and audit policy. So the next pillar we're going to say about updating software procurement standards. Right. So you're going to have you're going to have like a like an application are often the root cause of complex uh, identity and access management systems. So application typically introduce uh, different kind of identity stores. So these different authentication mechanisms. Uh, like like apps in apps says I'm not compatible with Microsoft Directory Service. I need to have an uh, IBM Novell or IBM or Novell Directory Store. Application would application typically uh, introduce new authentication mechanisms, which are really not com compliant with the organization, but you still need to manage them and support it. They bring uh, new authorization policies. So these are the common common uh, expandable challenges of any organization they see every day to day. When I say expandable, the reason is they, they keep introducing the new apps and new policies will keep getting added to the existing uh, existing uh, policies. So once you have, so the, the main goal of IAM Architect is to standardize these directory service security audit access policies in place. So, and he has to establish a organization standard or he has to keep updating the organization or organizational standards for software procurement, application uh, management or new softwares uh, in place and other systems. So, uh, they have to select the software from ISVs. Um, most of them do though, do select the softwares from ISV. So when they do that, they should be have or uh, these these ISVs or these apps should have an ability to integrate with the selected uh, identity stores or selected directory services in place. Uh, so the key role of organization even before implementing these ISVs applications is can they integrate with my existing identity store? That's the key checkpoint that the organization should make. So what are the uh, uh, benefits of these uh, procurement standards? Uh, one is a rapid, rapid deployment of new apps. Um, you're going to ease the integration with identity and access management infra. Low TCO, increased security, reduced training and uh, for end users, uh, common ones. And the, the gold one is like increased production for or productivity for end users. So these have their own challenges. So the challenges would include finding the right software for right features. Uh, they have to understand the organization challenge would ha need to understand the components involved um, and, and and what sort of an application do I need to purchase. That's the key stuff, key challenge. So and uh, and and then supportive ones would be like uh, does this application give me the security that I need to manage does they comply my uh, regulations or my audit policies so these are some of the uh, key challenges for any organization all right so we move on to the uh, the next pillar the next pillar talks about 
establishing software development standards for identity is. So as an organization business needs evolve, it needs new applications to implement new business functionality. So uh, yeah, I mean, this keeps changing and setting and enforcing development standards that describe how apps integrates with the identity and access management infrastructure uh, actually sets the stage for lower TCO. If you don't follow this principle, your TCO improves. It, it gets increases. There's no lower TCO. There's always a high TCO and lower security if, if you don't comply to these policies. When you do this, when you follow an, an, uh, an identity and access management infrastructure, what are the benefits? As I, as I kept telling since my start of my talk, uh, the benefits include applications do not create new identity management problems. They just, just keep flow. There will be a smooth flow with them. They will say they, applications can be developed more quick, more rapid, and the re administrative cost is totally reduced. You're going to increase the security by a, a, a tiny surface attack, right? I mean, you don't have a huge surface, surface attack because you have the compliance in place, the IAM strategies in place. And well, this has its own challenges. Uh, what are the challenges? Uh, the challenges of establishing software development standards includes uh, an authoritative source for identity information uh, that new apps can capitalize on. They need to ensure that apps use existing identity stores as well as existing authentication and authorization capabilities. Uh, this is for new apps or existing apps or this becomes a similar challenge. And uh, you need to understand how well the guidelines are being defined. How an integrate how do how do I integrate my software development lifecycle methodologies with these policies? Or how must how my applications must integrate with IAM infrastructure? And how easy is that to train internal and external developers to follow these guidelines. So these are the challenges uh, that organizations are facing with the existing IAM and for the ones which who are picking up uh, will have the similar uh, issues or challenges. So the final letter, we have come to the final letter and the final letter talks about developing and migrating identity of our applications. So once an organization has established standards for app development, uh, the new apps can be developed through, through these standards, F seamless. So existing apps should ha also have a same level of integration with the IAM infrastructure. So how do I start? I mean, to do this, like we need to take an inventory and categorize these existing apps. Uh, understand the values of each application, uh, the information they provide, what is the security characteristics that needs to be understood, what is the balance between the cost and migrating of change uh, each application requires. Uh, just just prioritize which prioritize which applications should be migrated first. That's the key uh, um, key uh, plan for any uh, IAM strategy. And the benefits. The benefits include reduce administrative overhead for managing your identities. Uh, time and again I say increase security and consistency across platforms or across applications. And this poses a fair bunch of challenges. So the challenges, the challenges for developing and migrating identity aware applications includes uh, understanding how your applications work so that the decisions can be uh, mapped to the IAM strategy. Uh, you have to select your own platform for migrating applications in, if you're migrating applications. So you need to understand, you need to tell your developers, choose the specific language. Uh, that's gonna be a challenge. So your app applications will be, will be coded in uh, a, uh, by .NET and the migration may not support the .NET, so that's just an example. And uh, you're going to select the identity stores that meet the application requirements. Um, 
it's we are doing the other way around right i mean we're going to develop an application but we are going to tell our tell the developers to say hey you have an iam strategy in place you need to code to fit these standards that's a key challenge and uh, selecting authentication and authorization techniques to meet uh, meet these requirements so uh, this is this is one of the uh, one of the fundamental and the key uh, challenges associated with uh, migrating identity aware applications well uh, i'm ending up ending this uh, ending this podcast here so because we have covered all the pillars of the identity and management uh, initiatives and we've spoken about like uh what are the what are the different business drivers for determining and implementing an iam strategy so what are the key um key pillars of these things and how what are the benefits and what are the challenges associated with each pillar we have we have uh talked through uh across there are no there are no uh, videos that i can demo for you guys but this is a this is a podcast where you can plug it on listen to my podcast while or be, even before i am or just go through the podcast when when you plan for i am that's this actually helps you understanding your network understanding the strategies that you need to be place understands any i am project uh, and you can you can follow uh, the standards in place so thank you very much for your time and I'll keep publishing I'll keep publishing with more podcast on IAM uh, infrastructure going ahead. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Cheers.